Thank you everyone for coming to our session this afternoon, Who Rescued Whom? A Dog Like Daisy in a Story of Service. I'm gonna turn it over to Melody uh, Palmer who will be introducing our speaker today. Hello and welcome to the live Sequoia Author Award Ceremony for Kristen O'Donnell Tubb, author of the 2019 Sequoia Children's Award for A Dog Like Daisy. If you haven't read it, you need to, it's wonderful. Kristen writes a variety of books, including children's historical fiction about a family who lives in the New York Public Library and YA, a mytho mythological fantasy about what would happen if there suddenly was a 13th zodiac sign. She's very talented and is here to talk about Who Rescued Whom? A Dog Like Daisy and a Story, a story of Service. Congratulations, Kristen, and thank you for visiting with us virtually. Oh my gosh, thank you. What you have to say. Melody, thank you so much. I am so excited to be here today. I hope everyone can hear me. Am I, do I sound like I'm doing okay? Okay, great. Jody says yes. And so I will follow Jody's, uh, <laughs> Jody's lead here. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. And I really, really appreciate how amazing um, librarians and educators of all kinds are being able to pivot on a dime and uh, being able to post things uh, for us all to share in this um, ceremony and this conference together. So I am so excited to be here today and to be a part of your online festivities and to talk a little bit about A Dog Like Daisy and where the inspiration came from um, and a little bit about kind of stories um, overall. So I just kind of wanted to start because the idea of who rescued whom, that's kind of an old idea for those who are familiar with dog rescue. Um, there's a saying among people who rescue dogs that says who rescued whom. And of course that means um, that dogs rescue their humans as much as humans rescue their dogs. And rescue is of course a big theme throughout a dog like Daisy. But I also kind of want to touch on the fact that this story really means uh, to me, it's also an idea of Daisy rescuing me, the author. So um, spoiler alert, Daisy <laughs> rescues me in the, um, in the end of this, this particular story. So I wanted to kind of touch on the idea of rescue and stories today. So flashing backwards to 2015 and see these gloomy skies. Um, I just, I was becoming pretty cynical um, when I was uh, writing back then. It felt like the world was becoming less and less empathetic to me. And no matter how hard the artists that I knew were trying to share stories with the world that would grow understanding and grow empathy and grow seeds of unity, it just, it felt very um, difficult to be able to do that. So honestly, um, 2015, I was starting to kind of lose hope in what I thought stories might be able to accomplish. So I was really um, found floundering a little bit and trying to find my way through the dark skies. <laughs> Um, but writers, of course, they can't, we can't turn off that what if part of our brains. So one bright day that same year, so this is 2015, one of my neighbors texted me and she said, can I please bring Louie up to play with Lucky in your fenced in yard? So um, these are pictures that I just so happened to take that day. That's Louie being really goofy up there mm -hmm. <laughs> in the upper left hand corner. And he is a great, he was a Great Dane puppy, still is a huge Great Dane dog. And so she texted and said, can I please bring Louie up to play with Lucky in your yard? And I said, sure, you know, bring him on up. So Louie and Lucky played and our neighbors, me and my neighbor kind of watched on. And um, she just in passing said, you know, the breeder that we bought Louie from, he actually also trains dogs to become service dogs for veterans with PTSD. And it was a big huh moment for me. And so, okay, you guys, I'm really showing off my Photoshop skills with this screen. 
<laughs> it's so terrible, but it really, it really was one of those huh moments. Um, I know that teachers like to call the moment when a student's eyes light up with understanding an aha moment. Writers have a very similar moment when they think of a story idea, um, but instead of aha, I understand, it's more like, huh, I wonder. And I like to say that all good story ideas live inside those three little letters, H-U-H, -H, huh. So that day, my huh moment sounded like this, huh. I wonder how service dogs learn all the amazing things that they know. I knew service dogs could fetch a newspaper. I knew that they could answer a ringing telephone. Um, I knew that they could retrieve something out of a refrigerator, but I didn't know how they learned those things. And I really sensed that there was a story in the learning. So I'm gonna take a minute here and conduct a poll with you guys. <laughs> so every school that I visit, I always ask this question and I hope I do this correctly, turning on this poll. So my first poll is yes or no, please answer if you have a pet of any kind, if you have um, dogs, cats, lizards, ferrets, bunnies. <laughs> Oh, this is so cool. It's really cool to watch this happen in uh, <laughs> in live time. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we're still waiting for a couple of responses. Yes, yes, awesome. Polling. Okay, this is this is about across the board what I see at school visits too, with regards to people who have pets. Um, to those who do not have pets. So you guys are a bunch of pet lovers too, I love it. Oh, and while we're, while we're waiting for the last few results, I want to introduce, these are my three muses. <laughs> this is up here in the upper corner, right here. Um, I hope you can see that dot, that's Lucky. And Lucky is a black golden doodle. So even though he's got some golden in him, he looks like a poodle. And this right here, that's Cookie, that little small dog in the upper um, photograph there. And then this goofy pug down here at the bottom, that's Myrtle. <laughs> She's very famous. And um, <laughs> this is Myrtle when she had jumped into a draining bathtub and she, find, she finds herself to be soaking wet in this picture and is extremely surprised by that. So, um, okay, it looks like about... Um, it looks like there's some more responses coming in, but it looks like about 60% of you guys have pets. So I am going to continue on and let's see, let me make sure I can do this. I'm going to clear this poll out and start another poll. And this again is yes, no. So if you answered yes, that you have a pet, now <laughs> you have to be honest here. How many of you do goofy voices for your pets? <laughs> I love asking this question at school visits because kids jump up and start doing the goofy voices that they do for their pets. And it's just phenomenal. I really, <laughs> I really love hearing all the goofy voices that kids do um, to voice their pets' uh, opinions <laughs> and thoughts. So um, across the board, when I ask this question at schools, it seems like about 80% of pet owners um, tend to also <laughs> tend to also voice their pets. Like they, you know, a pet will walk in the room and they'll say, "Hello, good morning. I love to see you," <laughs> and those kinds of things. So um, it seems like most people who own pets, and it looks like right now about forty percent of you do do go goofy voices for your pets. I do as well. Um, and so the reason why I kind of ask this and why I go back to this and this, these particular goofy voices is that um, Lucky over here, the black golden doodle, um, he is 12 years old. 
And since he was just a couple of months old, we have done this goofy, like, hello, I love you <laughs> voice for him. And we didn't realize it at the time, but I was kind of practicing writing a dog like Daisy. I had been doing dog voices for close to, gosh, eight or nine years by the time I got the idea for a dog like Daisy. So those of you who love doing voices for your pets as well, you might be practicing auditioning for something like that, <laughs> like an awesome pet story or, um, or uh, something like that, an animation uh, <laughs> something. So I really, I really do love doing um, goofy voices for pets. And so, but that whole time I was, I was practicing to write a dog like Daisy. Um, and so that was kind of a little bit of research. I like to think of those goofy pet voices as research. Oh, and just to go back to this slide right here for a second. Like I said, these are my three muses, Lucky, Cookie, and Myrtle. And when I do presentations like this, or I have a phone call, I close them out because they bark all the time. And my agent recently, when I had a phone call with him said, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't uh, shut those voices out of your life. That's your, that's who you listen to these days. That's your bread and butter. So I thought that was kind of funny that he um, also said, no, really, you should listen to those dogs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so in addition to goofy pet voices, I did lots of other types of research to write a dog like Daisy. Um, one of the things that I did was I emailed a fellow writer who also happens to be a dog trainer. Her name is Debbie Emery. And um, she's mentioned in the acknowledgments of a dog like Daisy. Um, but I emailed her and just said, can you help me understand kind of how dog training works, where they begin, how they go through the process. And so she invited me to join her at a school where juveniles live who have maybe pushed the boundaries a little bit in life. And so they all live in a dorm together and they attend this special school together. Um, so all of these juveniles um, go to this school together. And um, this particular organization that Debbie volunteers for they bring dogs once a week into these dorms um, for these to visit with these kids. And one of the dogs that they brought looked a lot like this dog here in this picture. And the, the dog's name was um, Gator. And Gator was a pit bull. And um, he looked what eventually became what looked like the dog on a cover of a dog like Daisy. And y'all, when they brought this big goofy pit bull dog into this um into this school into this dorm these kids these teens who were so aloof and kind of jaded and they tried to act really really cool they lost it around gator and it was just amazing to watch them just drop their their kind of facades and really just roll around on the floor with this dog and they scratched his belly and they kind of wrestled him a little bit and they cooed at him and they scratched him and it really just changed them. I watched this dog Gator change these kids and it was just fascinating. It was awesome. So a little bit of my cynicism that I told you about um, melted that day about what dogs can do to really help us um, kind of become better people. So I realized as I watched this massive friendly dog, Gator, that a pit bull is actually a perfect symbol of a veteran who is challenged by PTSD. Pit bulls are likely the world's most misunderstood dog breed. There are rumors that their massive jaws can lock shut, but they actually can't. And there are rumors that they are really very dangerous and kind of terrible with kids, but they were actually once called the family dog of choice in 19th century England. So pit bulls act how we train them to act. Our view of them becomes their reality. Their behavior lies in our expectations. So I know teachers can really relate to that idea with students, so I'm gonna repeat that part. Their behavior lies in our expectations. So like pit bulls, PTSD has been misunderstood for a very long time. 
And that's why Daisy became a pit bull. I thought it was the perfect representation of that. Um, another part of research that I did was with an organization called Southeastern Guide Dogs. They're also mentioned in the acknowledgments of a dog like Daisy. Um, I interviewed a trainer who works there. Her name is Katie Young. And Katie specializes in training dogs to assist veterans who have PTSD. And she, <laughs> Katie endured literally hours and hours and hours over several days, really spanning a couple of months of, of my questions. So she was very, very patient with me. And to this day, because of that, a portion of all sales of a dog like Daisy benefit Southeastern Guide Dogs. Um, so that's their URL at the bottom there, guidedogs.org. If you're interested in checking them out, I highly encourage it. You can even adopt a puppy and name the puppy as part of a donation. So that would be a wonderful birthday present or someone who really loves dogs. <laughs> Just as a hint, <laughs> they would really appreciate the support. Um, so slowly with all this research, Daisy started to become a very good service dog. And like a good service dog, Daisy has led me to places that I never dreamed a story would take me. So with Daisy, I visited McGuire Dix Lakehurst Base in New Jersey where one active duty officer told me he wished he'd had this book to read with his kids when they were younger. In Kentucky, I moderated a panel of veterans who had written books about coping with PTSD. And one of those gentlemen told me to keep writing important books for kids that they can handle. It. Daisy has been um, given to several VFW libraries and she's even available for sale in the National Museum of the Marine Corps. That's her in the Marine Corps Museum right there in the middle. <laughs> and near a base in Oklahoma, I had multiple letters from young readers who told me about their parents being challenged with PTSD. They saw their own families through the eyes of this sweet pit bull. So I'll, I'll leave these letters up for a little bit so you guys can um, get a chance to kind of see them and I'll read them in just a second. Sorry, I had to take a sip of water. <laughs> so this one says, Dear Mrs. Tubb, yes, this is your school, Julie. <laughs> I really made connections because my mom has PTSD and it's hard to deal with. If you don't have someone to help you, bad things can happen. So it makes a better read and could inspire many people. I think it will have many connections. And also on the back, he wrote, but also I made one more connection because my dad served in the Air Force and he would do anything. It was really hard, but he still did it because he loved me and my mom. <laughs> All right, let's see this next one says, Dear Daisy, which I love it when, random, when readers address the letter to Daisy instead of to me. It just is, that's one of the many, many beautiful things about writing um, for young readers. Dear Daisy, you are a beautiful and cool dog. <laughs> and I have some questions to ask, like, do you have post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, too? If you do, how do you have it? Have you been an army dog? P.S. My dad passed away in the army. And before that, he also had PTSD too. And then this one, dear Mrs. Tubb, what encouraged you to write a dog like Daisy? It is very interesting. My dad was in the army and he lost a lot of good friends. So this is three kids. These are three different kids all in the same school. Um, and so granted, the school is near a very large base, but you really never know what, know how a story is going to connect with a reader. And right, Jody, I'm with you. I want to give these kids all just the biggest hug. <laughs> I'm crying a little bit too, Julie. <laughs> so all of this is the story of how a dog like Daisy rescued me. Hearing readers talk about, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional over here because 
I really, really appreciate the opportunity to tell you guys how much it means when, um, when you share books like Daisy with readers. <sighs> so <laughs> all of this is the story of how Daisy rescued me. Hearing readers talk about their gratitude for this story, my cynicism about stories completely melted away. I was reminded that the very best way that we can connect with each other is through stories. Okay, Whew. so <laughs> today I'm here to remind you in case you might also be feeling jaded or cynical, because let's be honest, 2020 has been one heck of a year, <laughs> to please keep sharing stories. Children need books to feel less alone. They need stories to understand what they might have misunderstood. We need stories to connect and unite and to empathize. Nothing else is as effective as a story in doing this. You might keep, you must keep fighting to share stories that reflect all children, all children, because there is a story out there waiting to rescue a child. And sometimes only stories can do that. So, <laughs> This is me wearing my Sequoia Award. Um, they, uh, Melody and the wonderful folks at, um, <laughs> oh, thank you guys. I appreciate all the hugs and the tears along with me. Um, so this is me wearing the beautiful Sequoia Award. They asked me to include <laughs> a picture of me and the award. It is beautiful, you guys. It is so heavy and gorgeous, and I am literally wearing it as I speak right now, <laughs> and I just love it. And so you can see I couldn't resist um, pretending like I was an Olympian there in the upper left-hand corner, <laughs> this one right here. So um, I really, really adore the award. I'm so, so grateful for it. Um, I have a long list of people I'd love to thank for this Sequoia Award, and I really hope um, that I don't forget anyone. So really quickly, I have to start with my agent who never gave up, gave up on me, um, even though I was really ready to kind of give up on myself. Um, I'd also like to thank Catherine Teagan Books. Um, they're the publisher of A Dog Like Daisy, and they make beautiful books for young readers. Um, I'd love to thank Jody. Uh, Jody, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right. Burgerding? and Melody Palmer for all their help in coordinating this session. I really appreciate the help because I am not known for my technical expertise. Um, <laughs> I uh, appreciate so much the Oklahoma Library Association for the hours of coordination that go on behind the scenes for these awards. Um, I am so, so grateful that all of you guys uh, who volunteer to put in the hours behind these awards do that because it's very, very meaningful across the board, readers and authors alike. Um, <clears throat> I am very grateful to the Brown Brothers of Permabound Books uh, for inviting me to your beautiful state and arranging so many wonderful events on my behalf. Um, thank you to every school who has hosted me and allowed me to celebrate stories with their readers. Um, yes, Brown Brothers do rule. And two of those stories, Julie Kreft's, uh, who I know is in this session, <laughs> Julie Kreft's school is one of the ones they had to, <laughs> we had to reschedule that visit three times, you guys. And so I really appreciate the persistence of educators like Julie and Susan, <laughs> who uh, really, really, and Stacy, who really kept inviting me back. And eventually we did get that school visit done. <laughs> um, I appreciate all the teachers and librarians who have shared A Dog Like Daisy with your students. And I have a huge place in my heart for the Oklahoma students who have invited Daisy into their hearts. Um, okay, so let's see here. This screen, I'm going to open up 
And Jody, if I am not doing this correctly, please uh, let me know. But you guys can write your own message of who you're grateful for. I am super, super grateful. Oh, great. I do have it, it looks like. So I really, really um, am very, very grateful for all of the folks that I just mentioned, along with, I'm trying to see if I can get my <laughs> typing in here or drawing. It doesn't seem to be working drawing wise. Oh, it does for some folks. Kathy's got working. Let me just jump in real quick, Kristen. Um, you can, for everyone um, that would like to participate on this whiteboard, you should now see um, a menu a toolbar on the right hand side of your presentation screen. The default is drawing for the uh, with the little pencil, um, but you can click on that to. Um, for other options, including text. If you want to do text, you'll have to drag, uh, click and drag um, to create a text box screen. Uh, and then that should allow you to uh, type in your message. Well, I just confessed that I really do not have um, great tech skills. <laughs> and I even uh, opened this, Jody, in a different browser. I came to to this session in a different browser this time, but I am un, it doesn't appear to be working for me. So, but I am loving seeing all of these beautiful things that you guys are grateful for. Oklahoma libraries, my family, friends, and my eight dogs. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. I have three and I think that's exhausting. Um, dogs and cats, yes. Oh, and I see someone up here saying maybe waking up every day. <laughs> yes, amen, amen to that. Um, and dogs and cats and Harold. <laughs> this is really cool. Oh my gosh. This is really amazing. Technology like this is fun, someone says. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, my cat Harold. Is that like Harold and Maud? I don't see who wrote that, but if it is, you got my vote. I love Harold and Maude. <laughs> um, let's see, family, God, yes. Oh my goodness. The opportunity to be here, amen. I am with you. Oh, everybody is chiming in how much they love Harold. Harold must be super famous. <laughs> Like Myrtle. Myrtle is pretty famous, too. Every time I talk about writing a dog book, people ask me, request um, that I please write a, a book about Myrtle. And she's just this big, goofy pug. And I keep thinking I might do it someday. But so far, I haven't really got the... Uh... Oh, Harold is a frequent Zoom bomber. Oh, yes. Yeah. So is Myrtle. Yes. Okay. So that's how Harold is famous. Got it. Harold knows who his audience is. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love this. This is so great. So I, um, I really do strongly believe, of course, that the more we reflect on what we're grateful for, the happier and less cynical we all become. Um, and so, like I said, this, um, this message kind of started off with me. Um, Oh, Franklin, that's a good name for a cat too. So this whole um, presentation kind of started off with this idea, of course, of me really wondering, you know, can stories change the world? And, um, I, you know, and, and like I said, the, the moral of this story is yes, I honestly do believe that they can. Um, that stories are one of the best way, probably, I'm a little biased here, I know, but the best way that we can connect with each other, that we can empathize with each other, that we can um, sh sow the seeds of unity. So I really, really appreciate this. And I'm gonna take a picture of this before we move on, if you guys don't mind. It's, I'm gonna look back on this on days when I'm feeling more cynical. <laughs> so 
Thank you guys so much for participating in uh, in this screen. Oh, video games. I love it. Yes. My, um, my son would definitely agree with that one. It has really made the difference in our, um, in our social distancing. We have had a lot of uh, video game nights here at the Tub household. <laughs> oh my gosh, books, right there, books. I love it. Okay, I'm gonna switch to the next slide, but I, ho I, I this is being recorded. So hopefully Jody will be able to access this later because it's really great. Or if anyone yep. wants to take a picture of it too, yeah. You might, uh, Kristen, you might want to um, click that button again for uh, to disable the multi-user whiteboard. So you would just click on that. Okay, great. Button yes. again. Okay, got there it. you go. Thank Thanks. you. Katie. Yes. Um. So. Once again, I just want to thank you guys so much for um, inviting me to be a part of your online uh, conference. I am honored to be here, and I'd love to answer any questions that you might have that I didn't answer um, while I was tearfully <laughs> telling you guys um, how much I really, really appreciate you and you sharing A Dog Like Daisy with your young readers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. We have a um, little less than 15 minutes for question and answers. Um, so if you have questions for Kristen uh, or um, any comments, or if you've read any of the her other books that you would like to uh, talk about, uh, now is the time. And I see many are typing, so. Um, oh, thank you, Julie. That's very nice of you. Yes, I, I like I said, I have, Daisy, like a good service dog, has really led me to places where I never imagined. And it's been a phenomenal journey. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you, Danielle. I'm clapping back at you guys because I really clap back at. I think my younger generation of kids would say that doesn't mean what you think it means, mom. Uh, but I am clapping as well because I really appreciate the job that um, teachers, librarians, do to share stories with young readers. It is it means the world to me, but more importantly, it means the world to them. Um, I kind of tell this story quite a bit, but I'm going to go back and kind of tell a little bit about um, how I became a writer to begin with. I had an awesome elementary school librarian. Her name is Sheila Rollins. And I grew up in Athens, Tennessee, which is near the Great Smoky Mountains, tiny little town. And um, she had this amazing program where you could um, interview your favorite author by telephone if you read three of their books and did book reports on each one. So in sixth grade, I got to interview, all right, I'm going to do a drum roll for you guys, if you can hear that, Madeline LaIngle by telephone. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was phenomenal. And as it's obvious, I have never forgotten that. And I told Madeline Lee Engel when I was in sixth grade that I wanted to be a writer. And she didn't flinch. She didn't say anything like, you know, oh, well, you have to move to New York or you have to pay, you know, big bucks to study at a, at a university or something like that. She said, keep reading and you can do it. And that meant the world to me when um, I was in sixth grade. And so when I visit schools now, that is the number one message that I try to pay forward and carry forward is um, that writers are readers first and foremost. And anytime you wanna get better at anything that you wanna do, better soccer player, better guitar player, better, um, gosh, fencer, <laughs> reading a book about it will help you be better at it. Um, let's see, Kristen, do you think you'll keep writing dog-centric books? Yes, Courtney, absolutely. Um, we, uh, I, I, yes, Zeus just came out and I see Cammie said um, that you saw Zeus at Walmart. Yay, I love to hear that, I love to hear that. Zeus came out in early June and um, it is not a sequel to Daisy. It's definitely what I would call a companion book. It's kind of in the same vein. 
Um, oh, Julie says Zeus is fantastic. Thank you, Julie. Um, and next year in 2021, I have um, a third book in this same kind of um, dog genre. <laughs> um, and it's called Luna Howls at the Moon. And I cannot wait to share the cover with you guys. I tried to get permission today and HarperCollins wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't give me permission but it is it's amazing it's it's the sweetest little dog luna she is an emotional therapy dog and she and three of her clients um go on a quest throughout the city of austin texas so <laughs> thank you for asking that oh let's see um <laughs> oh yay Isaac oh well as soon as I get early copies Julie you know Isaac is my number one um reader for all things dog books so I will love to um share that one with him and I just found um a really cool fact about um these dogs that are trained to <laughs> hunt box turtles um and they are it, not to hunt them to, um, you know, harm them, hunt them to, in fact, save them. Because in many states, box turtles are endangered. And so there is this breed of dog, Boykin Spaniels, and they are excellent at finding box turtles in a massive field. And they are, are currently being trained um, to, or several teams have been trained to help these environmentalists find turtles and study them and help them try to save um, the turtle populations in different um, environments. So that is the book that I'm researching right now. And I got to be honest, I, I'm in love with these little dogs that, that um, go out and find turtles and help these scientists really study them. And one of the experts that I interviewed for that particular book said, it's really fascinating when you think about one species helping to save another. And that's kind of how I feel about dogs as a whole, because, you know, there's a reason why they're man's best friend. Um, dogs get trained all the time to save humans, but now we can see that they are just as willing to help turtles, um, dolphins, whales, other species as well. So, you know, hey, may we all lead our lives more like dogs <laughs> and become that big hearted and giving, right? Um, oh, I love the cover of the 13th sign. Wonderful. I do too. It's very bold and brilliant. It's my only um, fantasy um, that has been published. And um, it is uh, an astrological um, fantasy. It is also kind of a quest that takes place throughout New Orleans. And it is the uh, the main character, Jalen, accidentally awakens the 13th Zodiac sign, and um, she has to battle all the other 12 um, Zodiac signs in order to send Ophiuchus, the 13th sign, back up to the heavens and sit and um, kind of correct the uh, the disruption in the universe. And I really, I get a lot of readers who loved Percy Jackson. And the, the series of those books, because it is a Greek mythology um, adventure. And so a lot of times um, when kids have zoomed through all of the Percy Jackson books, um, uh, librarians will um, uh, refer 13th Sign kind of next, which is very nice. Uh, let's see. So I, did, uh, I hope I'm saying your, right, your name right. Sa Sada? Sadia? You've written books for middle grade readers and teens. Do you have plans to write picture books? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question, Sadia. Um, I love picture books. I think they are the, the highest form of literature actually, and I'm not being sarcastic here, that, that we humans can produce the art and the, um, and the text together it, it accomplishes things just like with graphic novels. It accomplishes things that um, that I think text alone cannot. And I have written a couple of picture books um, that I really, really hope in 2020 find a home sometime soon. But I think they are the hardest thing to write. 
um, because they are so spare and beautiful and you have to be able to capture really an entire emotion it, in a, a short amount of time. So, yeah. Thank you for asking that. Oh, let's see here. Hold on. Okay. I'm trying still to have five minutes. So again, if you have any questions or comments for Kristen, there's still plenty of time to get those entered into the chat box. Yes. Thank you, Jody. I, um, I was, I, my screen was flashing something and I was trying to figure out what it meant. <laughs> okay. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Let's see. Public chat. Awesome. Um, so this year, I, I think that possibly some of you are, um, I know some of you are definitely school librarians. Um, I would assume that some of you are also public librarians. And I just want to say a huge thank you for everything that you guys have had to do very last minute um, <laughs> in 2020. And um, it really has been, a tremendous, uh, oh, Melody has put, if you're interested in serving on a Sequoia committee, applications are live now. And yes, if you are interested in doing that, please do sign up because it means the world, like I said, it means the world to authors, but more importantly, it means the world to readers. Um, but um, yes, so I know this has been an extremely challenging year across the board for all of us. So thank you for all that you guys are doing to, um, help keep readers engaged because I know it is um, has been an interesting challenge and it appears that the fall will continue to be an interesting challenge. And I appreciate that it seems like nobody can rise to a challenge like educators and librarians, like you guys know your business. <laughs> so that is greatly, greatly appreciated. Oh, let's see. Oh, thank you, Isaac. <laughs> Julie's um, son, Isaac, has been kind of my number one reader when it comes to, I, I send him dog books and hope that he likes them because if Isaac likes them, I feel like I'm working in kind of the right direction. So he may, I may ask um, if he might get a very early read of of Luna and maybe the turtle book to to get his thoughts on that if you if he would be interested in doing that. <laughs> oh, and this year because of such an interesting because 2020 has been very interesting, the galleys and arcs of um Luna are all going to be e-galleys. So if you have an Edel, Edelweiss or NetGalley um, account and you would like an early copy of Luna, just email me and let me know that. Um, my email is uh, kristentub, all one word, at iCloud.com. You know what? I'll put it right here in the chat. That's my email. And my... Um, that's my website, kristentub.com. And if you are interested in doing a virtual school visit this year, please do let me know. Um, like I said, I know that 2020 and probably into 2021 is going to look a little different. Um, but I do Skype visits. I've done Skype visits for years. And um, I'd be willing to work with you on kind of what you need because I know that it's <laughs> it's going to look different this year. So um, I'd be definitely willing to work with, you know, if you're doing Zoom or if you're doing um, this wonderful platform, anything like that. So um, yeah, we probably need to work out the details of that. So yes, um, I think that my time is quickly running out. Yeah, so we've got uh, court, what time for one question um, from Courtney? Uh, your work spans different narrative types. What was your most enjoyable book to write? Oh, Courtney, thank you. I did not see um, that question. Popeye. Um, so let's see. I, <laughs> I. Oh gosh, I write a lot of historical fiction. Let's see, John Clem, 
story seeker, story collector, selling hope and autumn are all historical fiction. 13th sign is fantasy and Daisy and Zeus are considered contemporary. Um, even though they're told from a dog's point of view. Um, I, gosh, I wouldn't be able to narrow it down. I think I really love uh, all kinds of narrative types, which is why I kind of write across um, different narrative types. I, I obviously love dog books enough to just continue going with them. And I think that there are enough interesting dog stories in the world to continue doing that for a while. Um, but I'm a huge fan of teaching. Well, teaching is a word that I hesitate to use because my primary goal as a writer for young readers is to entertain them. But um, I, I love using history as a lens as to how people who say lived in 1928 are very similar to um, people who live in 2020. Um, it's, it's very, uh, interesting to see that people still want, um, the very best for their families and they want the very best for their, um, friends and they want, um, <laughs> love and they want, um, to have fun and be entertained. And I'm passionate about telling stories from a point of view that really historical stories that touches on the side of history that we haven't heard from yet. Um, there are so many stories that haven't been told in history yet from different points of view. And I'm passionate about sharing stories written by others who are doing that and trying to put as much of that into my own stories as possible. Um, so thank you for asking that, Courtney. I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I think we're, I think the clock has ticked down. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you guys have other sessions that you probably are getting to today. But again, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me be a part of your day. And, um, and again, I'm just full of gratitude. Thank you. You're welcome, Kristen. And thank you again for uh, coming today. Let's give Kristen a big uh, round of applause. Uh, I know hopefully she can hear me giving her applause right now. Um, this has been great. Again, the recording will be available later this afternoon. Uh, and we'll go ahead and close it out. We will see you at two o'clock for the next session, uh, which is Take Five Adult Programming. Have a good break, everyone, and we'll see you at two o'clock.